Hello and welcome to The Print. I'm Snehesh Alex Philip. Well, Indian elections are over, but there is one election that the whole world is closely monitoring. Yes, I'm talking about the upcoming elections in the US. And it's going to be a tight race. But what does this mean for India and the Indian diaspora and the US? What is at stake for India and the Indian diaspora? And for this, I have a very interesting guest to carry forward the discussion. I have with me Ms. Asha Jadeja. She's a Silicon Valley venture capitalist for the last 25 years. Well, and she's also uh, one of the early uh, investors uh, in Google and PayPal and is currently employed or currently engaged in bettering the uh, Indian stakes in Washington, D.C. Uh, thank you so much and welcome to the print, Ms. Jareja. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So the moot question, what is at stake for India first? So whether it's Biden or it's uh, sorry, not Biden now, it's, it's Kamala Harris, whether it's Kamala Harris who wins or whether it's uh, Trump. First of all, the policies towards India are not going to change a whole lot simply because uh, the U.S. Uh, is, is, is heavily invested now in making sure that it has a, a you know, a, a warm and productive relationship with India because of its current disentangling from China. It is actually almost uh, in a you know in a developing cold war with china and so india has i mean something as large as india has become critical to the security and the the indo pacific strategy uh, strategy of um, you know uh, or strategic thinking of the us and so you will find that uh, that both both parties democrats and republicans have very similar sort of a blueprint of what should be their policy in the indo pacific and there india is the anchor it's a you know and, and Currently, because of uh, not having any entanglements in Afghanistan, uh, U.S. has really pivoted away very strongly, even from you know having bases in Pakistan and stuff like that. So, in that sense, I don't see much is going to differ whether it's Democrats or Republicans. But what what's at stake right now is that India needs to very proactively and aggressively put its egos and sens sensitivities behind it, and really invest in the relationship with the US and why it's big, well first of all it's not either or in terms of you know it's whether it's Russia or you know US or something like that it's none of that I think that the truth of the matter is that right now Russia is falling way behind as a you know as a, as a as an entity as a power as a as a great power in fact it's not a great power anymore um, second I think India's insecurity that it's too close to the Chinese border it needs that friendship and the partnership and the defense alliances with uh, Russia. I think that's also uh, misguided because Russia is now running out of a lot of its weaponry. It's just, it's stretched thin in the Ukraine war. It's not gonna be able to help India if we had any any issues with, uh, with China. So India needs to aggressively now move forward with closing ties with the US, especially defense and uh, security ties with the US. And we need to be less sensitive about things like, oh, why did the State Department, you know, complain to us about the assassination attempt on some, you know, stupid terrorist who is here in the US? Or why did they not stop Canada from, uh, you know, from uh, a smear campaign against India for killing, you know, Niger or something like that? So Indians are sensitive right now and they are thin skinned. They need to develop a thick skinned. I think Indians are also, uh, Snehesh, very sensitive about um, the articles sometimes that come out in the left-wing media of the US, like New York Times and Washington Post. And I think that's something that uh, Indians need to be less thin-skinned about and say, we'll do whatever it takes to uh, to to make sure that we have this uh, partnership written in cement, in stone. Uh, one last thing before you ask me another question is that I also think that uh, the Indian diaspora is now 5 million people strong. Uh, not only that, but it's also in very high uh, positions of prominence in the tech sector, in uh, uh, in academia, and also in uh, in medicine in the U.S. So many people sometimes jokingly tell me, "Oh, Indians are running America now." I mean, <laughs> to some extent, it is true in technology, especially in technology and academia and medicine. So. Um, 
So we need to take this relationship seriously. And I feel that we are not taking it as seriously as we should. You know, that's an interesting point that you mentioned that India needs to be more thick skinned when it comes to, you know, US and when it comes to criticism from the State Department or from the uh, media there itself. But before I carry forward this, uh, you know, I'll come back to this point. But since you mentioned diaspora, the fact is that, as you rightly mentioned, Indian diaspora is very strong. Actually, India has, you know, the biggest diaspora and globally, you know. And uh, traditionally, if you if if one has noticed the Indian diaspora voting pattern, mm -hmm. it is said that they vote more for the Democrats, right? True. True. Uh, but uh, in this case, you know, you have both Democrats and even Trump going ahead and openly, you know, engaging with the Indian community there, Indian origin community there, and trying to reach them out. So, do you think there is going to be any change in voting pattern? Or the, are there more fence sitters right now in uh, uh, on the Indian community there? I think there might be a movement towards. Uh, uh, I think there is a there's a there's a little bit of a trend, a growing trend towards republicanism, simply because the uh, you know Indian uh, diaspora here is uh, you know is beginning to. Uh, well, first of all, not only is it you know very wealthy. Uh, so in terms of just sheer economics, actually, it's better to support a, ca a candidate who's a Republican simply because it's just lower taxes and just easier to deal with, uh, you know, in, in, over here in the U.S. Uh, so in that sense, yes. But I think increasingly people have been feeling a little bit of um, reticence about uh, people like Kamla, for example. And I'm sorry about that because I know her and, you know, I really like her as a person. And... Uh, She's from California. She was our attorney general, and we all supported her big time uh, in her run for presidency. But I still feel that the Indian uh, diaspora does some pockets of it does feel that you know uh, there could be more proactive uh, you know participation. There should be more proactive party from the White House uh, yeah. in, in making sure that we that the outreach towards Indians is is much more uh, tangible, you know? So things like I said, with, for example, a lot of people feel that the uh, Biden administration maybe became a little bit slow on closing on quad, uh, you know, on, on, on establishing the quad relationship, the quad meetings and, and things like that. People feel that the Biden administration slowed down a little bit. Uh, so you might see a little bit more shift towards Republicans. You know, you know I, I can understand, you know, from the diaspora point of view, lower taxes, um, you know, better policies. So they might be looking at Republicans. But from an Indian point of view, and correct me if I'm wrong, I feel that whether it is uh, Democrats or Republicans, the India policy, there's not going to be much change when it comes to their policy, you know, because uh, the state, as, as in the state, uh, policy would remain the same. For example, when Obama... Uh, came in. I still remember Obama's famous comments where he said that shops are uh, sh jobs are shifting from Buffalo to Bangalore, right? And he was critical and he wanted better ties with China. And then yes. everything changed. So Obama was the same person who you know invested in relations with India, who uh, did the entire pivot to Asia in terms of military. So do you think uh, there would be any change? Am I am I right or am I wrong? No, I don't think uh, because things have shifted right from the Obama times. I think the, we are, I think, very openly and very, uh, you know, very, very acutely at uh, at a, in a cold war with China. And this is new. This is in the last four years. Right. So so the policy that that is the policy shifts that you see in the U.S. right now in Washington, D.C., are treating China as uh, as an aggressor, you know, as 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 a problem, and uh, we are trying to get out of multiple, you know, situations, multiple sort of economic tangles into with with China. But I think also more importantly, what you'll see is that, uh, you know, as as the uh, both Biden and Trump, uh, Trump will be more aggressive on imposing tariffs on China. But as you see that, I think uh, you know there's going to be more and more. I mean, the the pivot to India is is absolutely critical. It's real, and so I think Obama era policies are probably irrelevant right now, simply because the you know the situation is so different, and the uh, you know and the uh, uh, the geopolitical situation is not only it's becoming multipolar, but it's also becoming kind of you know um, you know with a with a unipolar 
order coming together in 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 South Asia in with China there, and uh, so there is the, you know there are these uh, sort of uh, you know fault lines that new fault lines that are developing which have come about only in the in the Biden era. So uh, whatever Trump does, I mean, I'm guessing right now that it's going to be very much a uh, continuation of the same policies by Trump and people, except that as far as Trump, if Trump comes into the White House, we'll see more serious tariffs. And that could include some extra tariffs on India. But again, we should not, we should not be spooked out by that. India should not be spooked out by that because what's critical right now is for our own geopolitical safety and and our own security and our own strength. We need to leverage the U.S. and we need to leverage today. You know, uh, Snesh, I would say a, a Google uh, could perhaps defeat an enemy much better than uh, bombs. You know, and we need to recognize that. We need to understand that this is this is this is where American power lies. And we, we need to make those deep inroads into into our into our diaspora, you know. I completely agree with you on that. Now, since you mentioned Trump, you know, in the past, be it Biden administration, be it anyone in the past, we've always they've always spoken about shared values, right? And you know, they keep harping on the whole about democracy, shared values, things like that. But of late, the Republicans and especially uh, Trump hasn't been really talking about shared values. What he talks about is shared interest. Right. Is there a difference that you see in this approach between shared values and shared interests? You know, the listen, Trump is overall transactional. OK, and he's unpredictable and he's yeah. transactional. He for him, it's all about the money. You know, what can he bring into the U.S.? What kind of jobs can he, you know, help create in the U.S.? Where can he sell better arms? Where can he sell more airplanes? Where can he sell sell more oil? That's Trump. So he's purely, I mean, he's he is definitely transactional, unlike the Biden team, which used to be much more, uh, I would say, anchored around values of democracy, freedom, freedom of speech, or, you know, protection of minority rights, rule of law, yeah. and stuff like that. So India very much, I mean, I... If you you know we all know that India probably falls into a category which is even more uh, robust and solid in 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 uh, you know in democracy in the rule of law in the in these in the strength of the judiciary uh, than sometimes you know aspects of the U.S. So uh, so so we we have really nothing to complain about as far as that goes. Um, but I think Trump will see him in the beginning at least having more of a transactional. A relationship with India, but that said, you know he is going to be a lame duck president, right? Which means after this presidency, he's gone, and yeah. so that whole notion of sort of you know the pressure that he had in the first term of uh, of uh, you know wanting to uh, close on deals, wanting to close on sales, uh, you know that's going to be much less now, and I think that with JD Vance, uh, there is uh, there's probably going to be much warmer relations with with India. Uh, you know, and and partly because he knows the culture so well, his wife is Indian and he's American. Um, you know, but he understands the values that the Indian, uh, you know, Indian government or India, India itself rests on, which is values of uh, you know of, of of strong families, of a strong culture, and of traditions. And he, so he's an old-fashioned conservative, uh, J.D. Vance. And I can, you know, my guess right now is that if, you know, if the Trump team does well. Vance is going to be, of course, running for next eight years of presidency. If they do well, if they do well, you know. And I have a, you know, my guess right now is that they're going to do well, actually. And part of the reason is because we already have inflation and we already have a sort of a, a you know, a scare for recession, which is getting behind us now. So, for example, you'll see from the federal, you know, from the feds, you will see noises about uh, reducing, uh, you know, interest rates. So right now, the interest rate for borrowing money is almost close to 6%. And uh, that, I think, will be going down as, you know, we'll see in the next few months. If that happens, that's going to be a, a plus for Trump. But, so, you know, I can clearly see that, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, in your, in your sense, the Republicans might do better. But if I get you correctly, what you're trying to say is that it's not Trump that matters. Of course, it matters for the next four years if he becomes a president. 
but it is going to be his VP pick that will matter. And the VP pick is someone who, as you mentioned, has an Indian connection. His wife is a practicing Hindu. Um, and so you think that India should bet on the VP uh, to carry forward this relationship? No, no. I think I think India should do whatever it has to do to strengthen our ties with uh, with Trump, which are extremely strong in any case, you know. So yes. that I'm not worried about. But India must keep a JD Vance in, in its on its radar, you know, because it's an important it's, he's an important rising leader in the conservative movement, and uh, Americans want to see a restoration of a situation where there is uh, you know less sort of random arbitrary open illegal uh, immigration that there is a, a you know that there are some breaks applied on the runaway inflation right now and uh, so I, I i do see that uh, you know that we, we that vance is going to play an important role going forward you know coming back to your initial statement where you said that indians need to be thick skinned when it yeah. comes to criticism from the us right uh, well i can say for the fact that you know despite all the uh, you know upward trajectory in the india us ties there is still an element of distrust when it comes to the US. Now, this distrust primarily comes from the fact, from the past experience, not just of India, US, but also about how US has dealt with other countries. Correct. You know, where it is capable of dumping someone when they no longer serve the interest. Like Afghanistan and like Pakistan. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Pakistan will keep coming on and off in their trajectory, but Afghanistan is something that just dropped like a hot potato. It it dropped, but you know uh, what worries me is that the Pakistan relationship is so old that a lot of uh, sort of the old Pakistan hands in the State Department and in Washington D.C. are still around, and I find that problematic. Uh, I, you know, I I think uh, I think I think those same people look out for uh, for the interests of 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 the pakistani sort of you know in not only the nation but also pakistani interests in the region and i i worry about that uh, you know because there are old hands in the state department and in you know, not not pentagon not defense or anything but in the state department there are some old you know and in and the in, Senate, in the congress they continue to have a uh, good hold they have a little bit of a foothold hopefully it's kind of it it'll 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 go, it'll go down slowly but they uh, they do have i mean you know there is a, and now the th the problem is that they are, the pakistani uh, you know pro pakistani people are piggybacking on the whole movement towards pro palestine and they are they are sort of uh, they are they are leveraging the muslim ummah around the world uh, for uh, for for support and uh, and so for example you do find that the old sort of pro pakistan people who are in washington dc would be you know think tanks and things like that could be getting funded by uh, you know by the middle eastern countries so you don't know if what qatar is funding or what uh, you know some of the other regional players there are funding in the us so it's a, for me I, it's a, it's a worrying issue so you think that india should invest more politically in the in Washington DC, absolutely, Snehesh, absolutely, and uh, you know we in the diaspora have started doing it. So people like myself, you know, a few other folks have started endowing chairs in universities, or you know, endowing research scholars at Hoover Institute at Stanford, or endowing some kind of a research uh, you know fellow at uh, you know some other think tank in Washington DC. And uh, you know, and, and but that's the, that. And the diaspora can do very little. I mean, TK, you know, whatever we can do, we'll do, and we'll continue doing that. But uh, the Indian government needs to be much more systematic about investing in Washington D.C., which means getting to know Washington D.C., supporting think tanks that are India friendly, like Hudson, like Rand Corporation, like Hoover. Uh, you know, it should be it should be supporting these these entities as India, not as BJP, as India. And yeah. so I, I, you know, if you, I would strongly recommend, uh, you know, you to take a look at something called the Israel lobby. You know, uh, yes. the Israel lobby is extremely strong in Washington, D.C. They have everybody really in good wishes and in goodwill with, with the U.S. And whatever Israel, uh, you know, needs or the protection it needs, the U.S. will give it without question. And, uh, you know, to some extent, 
our goal should be that we have support of a giant like us not just because us is you know good guys or something but because we have shared values we are free nations we are democracies and we are we are significantly different from the authoritarian bloc which is china iran uh, russia and north right. korea right we are different and so we should invest in this relationship uh, and and heavily so in fact my hope is uh, you know that when the prime minister is here next month that some of us get a chance to sit down with him and tell him that this is this is of existential importance you know i mean heavens forbid if there was uh, an issue that china has in the indo pacific right it goes to war or has some you know some major uh, you know uh, flare up in the taiwan region uh, you know india needs to be prepared for that kind of a situation we need to have you know uh, better preparation for what's happening in arunachal pradesh ladakh and so on and i think having us as our our partner just for deterrence if nothing else is critical you know but india is also caught in a situation where you know it talks about strategic autonomy you know um, and as from i said who? earlier that there's from a who, deep right? yeah pardon yeah. from who strategic autonomy from who exactly so strategic autonomy in india sense is from uh, is from the western pressure you know to be part of a block you know uh, so in your sense what do you think india should do so india can keep talking about strategic autonomy and you know things like uh, you know uh, you know wait what's the word that dr jay shankar keeps using some fantastic word that uh, uh, you know oh, oh strategic ambiguity i Absolutely. mean it's okay chalo kar let them do that that's fine but india needs to know that uh, that india has a strong presence already in the us right indians have a huge presence and very strong amount of influence in the us number one number two it needs to recognize that uh, we will never have china as a friend ever it's not going to happen okay and if we understand which side our bread is buttered we could be saying one thing we could be saying you know ke ha you know strategic ambiguity and autonomy and sure but behind the scenes behind the closed doors we need to have much more solid ties with the us so that we are never our security is never threatened you know and uh, and as india rises uh, you know china is beginning to get uncomfortable about uh, the rise of india it wants to be and openly so it wants to be the hegemon in in asia yeah. it does not want india to be uh, you know exercising any any muscle as its economic heft grows um the the chinese also recognize that the indian diaspora is becoming too powerful in the us and they don't like it uh it, it, that's not the case with the chinese diaspora you know we don't have the chinese diaspora having any influence here the indian diaspora is a different matter so the chinese are beginning to get uncomfortable about this i think you know uh, yeah i mean we we can talk about strategic autonomy and all that but india needs to start behind closed doors needs to have back channels with uh, even track 2 with uh, with with us well that's a very interesting point that you mentioned i completely agree with you that india needs to invest more uh, in washington dc but uh, thank you so much uh, asha ji for talking to the print and for carrying forward to the uh, carrying forward this discussion viewers we will have more of her on our show as the election approaches in the us and as developments take place she's someone who is a very strong supporter of uh, you know deeper india us ties as you would have seen so uh, uh, asha ji we would love to have you more on this show and we'll carry forward this discussion thank Absolutely. you so much thank you snehesh thank you nice to meet you also this time yes thank you